Now I'd like to resume the conference. For the next session in our lineup is titled Colonialism and Delocalization, the Neglected Dimensions of Our History and Politics. I would now like to call Dr. Charles Amjad Ali on stage so that he can introduce our guest and commence the session. We are covering an exceptionally broad and yet a valid theme for people who have lived long-term colonialism, both direct state and also imperial market economies. But I'm here to introduce two friends, both Dr. Jaffa, who he and I work on a number of issues and number of issues right now. He is working at a university with which I have been attached also. But more than anybody else, I want to introduce you to Karamat Ali, one of the most difficult tasks that Dr. Heather gave to me was to introduce Karamat Ali. I did not know where to begin my introduction. Sorry. I have known Karamat for a good 50 years of my life, which is almost more than two-thirds of my life. And I have got occasions that I can't bring out in public, but <laughs> I can talk to about Karamat, about things that we have done or left undone. And there are a lot of things that we have done which have not always been within the realms of statecraft or as a part of that statecraft. It's it, both very hard and easy for me to talk about Karamat. Easy because I've known him for this long. But hard is because I do not know what aspect of his magnificent, awe-inspiring and exemplary life I should talk about. Karamat is an awesome human being. And I say this to you as a, not as a, as a easily, a, let me say, impressed person. So, so I, I say this as a beginning part. Uh, we have shared high difficulty and prob problematics in our life, even life-threatening situation and times in our lives under various different aspects of military dictatorships in Pakistan. Now, we may call them democracy of various kind, but the sham of democracy notwithstanding, we have fought on the issues of democracy, hope, rights, on women's issues, and also on minorities, and most particularly, Karamat's passion and love is about labor and working classes. And that's not only because of the commitment that Karamat has made, but he has fought for these rights and against state kleptocracy. And there has been a very major state club. Sorry, am I, I don't know how much I can say in this area <laughs> before some hammer comes down my head, but it's all right. You will talk about it, Java Saab. Karamat has single-handedly come out as, and I use the word very carefully, as a savior on numerous occasions for people who suffer, people who are totally dislocated, disowned by this society. And their lives and livelihoods have been threatened, if not completely destroyed at various points in Pakistan's 76 years history. And Karamat has been there and fought for their freedom, for their basic rights, and fight so that those rights, whatever they are, should not be taken away or wrenched away from them by anybody's state right. Coming, coming from an economic and social background which we have mostly ignored, the background which we don't take into consideration as an ec economic factor, if every possible sources are looked at it, Karamat's success should not be there. He has fought all the circumstances, the limits of those circumstances and has come out of it as a shining example of a man who has struggled for democracy, rights, justice and especially for labor. I mean, Karamat, his thesis is right now sitting in front of Dr. Jaffer and I to look at and do the rightful thing. 
He worked at the Institute of Social Studies at The Hague and went almost to the point of PhD and decided not to pursue it. But that's not all. He has had serious company with people like the Dalai Lama. How many people can say they know even who Dalai Lama is? He has not only ate and drank, talked about it, but even tried to arrange for the Dalai Lama to come to Lahore to see the emaciated Buddha. And people just don't realize that side of the life. He has fought with people and been with people like and has been serious advisor to ILO, to European Union on, on the labor issues in Pakistan for both FES and also Geneva, uh, sorry, uh, Strasbourg. He has held a long and I would argue very authentic struggle against military dictatorship. There are a lot of people can talk about it. Karamat has carried that battle almost all his adult life. Not everybody, and he has survived. So he's sitting in front of us and we can celebrate him today. Karamat has been part of the inner circle with our great artists like Faz Ahmad Faz and has a very proud picture in his house with Faz Ahmad Faz and Karamat sitting at his feet, which is a great example of where he was. But besides that, he's also been a, a student of Sade Khan doing calligraphy. So please put those two together in your head and you'll begin to figure out who Karamat is. He sat in Lahore when the Sade Khan was painting the roof of Lahore Museum. And what he did there, I'm not going to talk about, <laughs> but, but I'm going to <laughs> And this is Zia's period, please understand what I'm talking about here. So, he has sat with them, he has even had encounter with a neighboring Hindu, Hindutva man of Modi in Gujarat, and he walked out of the conversation with him. So, I'm telling you these things because I know them personally in our conversation. This, I don't know, Java Sahib, I have not had the time to look at your, your brilliant book that you have written on Karamat and you will talk about that. But this is my own part of the rec recollection sitting with him. So he went to Gujarat and came out and I'm finishing this very quickly. Karamat had a long life involvement with labor and coming from the heritage himself, that heritage. He was a child labor, which most people don't even know. He has an unbroken, lifelong struggle for labor and the trade union movement and is the founder of one of the leading civil society institutions dealing with the labor rights issues. That's the Pakistan Institute of Labor, Education and Research. And three of its board members are sitting right here in, <laughs> in this thing, right? Asma is there, Dr. Jafar is there, and then I've been attached with it for almost all my, what I call cognitive life. This is Karamat's legacy. No one lifetime can achieve what Karamat has achieved. I have nothing more to say about the great achievement that Karamat is, uh, how gifted he is and what a gift he is in our lives and in this society. I can of course talk about my friend Karamat for a long time, but I don't want to take away from Dr. Sayyid Jafar Ahmed, who is about to deliver a highly important lecture on colonialism and decolonization and, 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 and as we have always worried, we all knew about colonization but decolonization becomes a much more complex issue. The neglected dimension of our history and politics, this has been the theme close to Karama's heart and he has pursued it all his life. Thank you very much and welcome Dr. Jab. <laughs>
Thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Charles Amjadali, uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. Professor of Justice and uh, Christian Community, uh, Dr. Asma Heda. Uh, Karama Saab has also graced the occasion, faculty members, students, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> I take it as a big honor to have been asked by Dr. Asma Heather and the organizers of the conference to be a part of this conference on the wider concept of challenging linearity. I will be failing in my effort to place myself in this conference if I do not realize that I can be a part of this informed gathering only as a student who has been considered as carrying certain thoughts worthy of placing before this August gathering. I must mention at the outset that the theme I'm going to delve into as the subject of my paper, that is colonialism and decolonization, has something to do also with the concept of linearity and a professed undertaking of it as a challenge that needs to be addressed by the economists of today's Pakistan and elsewhere. I have, uh, as I have understood in the last three days after listening to the papers presented here and the presentations made on this floor, the linearity in economic and at a larger level in social sciences is itself something that got enhanced if not cultivated during colonial times. In the submissions that I shall make, I'll try to explain how a colonial state designed itself structurally and how its policies were made with the objective to control the society by disintegrating the integrating features of the country they had come to rule. I shall try I shall also try to look into the post-independence state in Pakistan and how both imbibed not only the spirit but also the practices of the colonial system. Here I must pause a little bit and say a few words about the designation this lecture has been given. It goes to the credit of the IBA and its School of Economics and Social Sciences that it realized the importance of labor and labor movements and decided to dedicate this lecture to one of the most notable labor leaders of the country, Mr. Karamat Ali. Karamat Ali has spent the major part of his life he spread over near 75 years in the labor movement of the country. He began his practical life as a factory worker who took part He began his practical life as a factory worker who took part in industrial relations, dialogues, labor strikes, sit-downs, and other educational activities with the aim to seek better working conditions for the laborers. Along with his preoccupation in the factories and on the streets, he also continued his education. In the early 1980s, with the support and patronage of some of the most committed civil society figures of the country, like Professor Karar Hussain, uh, Mr. Ghulam Kibriya, Mr. M.B. Nakvi, Mr. Nabi Ahmed, and Dr. Zaki Hassan, he established Pakistan Institute of Labor Education and Research. This institute took to itself the responsibility to integrate the trade union's work bring them under one roof to evaluate their past and to program their future, and also to connect with the trade union movements abroad. Pilar also served as a research and teaching institute for the labor and those who aspired to do research in labor-related themes. Inspired by the writings of Paul Ferreri, Pedagogy of the Oppressed and the Politics of Education, Culture, Power and Liberation, Karamat Ali and his like-minded colleagues embarked upon a mission 
aimed at creating a new knowledge base in a post-colonial setting, aspiring to educate the labor along a wider socio-economic vision above mere economism that had encaged a good number of trade unions in their work. In the last around four decades, the Institute has produced a number of books, research-based reports, projection material, and, and has also trained at least two generations of labor activists, researchers, and others. Karamat Ali's vision and work goes beyond the labor affairs and encompasses uh, encompass global and particularly South Asian issues. In the domain of peace and peace movement, he has made significant contributions, and therefore he is today very rightly acknowledged as one of the most notable peace activists of South Asia. The colonial and the new colonial juxtaposition that had once ignited his realization of where to begin his work on labor movement from has also encouraged my years-long endeavor to understand the state of the state of and society in contemporary Pakistan in the background of their colonial past. This paper, entitled Colonialism and Decolonization, the Neglected Dimensions of History and Politics, is a modest outcome of this very endeavor. As I said that I'm standing here more as a student of history and politics, I'm tempted to revisit our creation as a nation state, or to be more precise, a nation state to be, and to see the path traversed by us in the course of time. I will begin by highlighting the fact that 76 years ago, in 1947, Pakistan's emergence on the map of the world was a momentous event and a unique occurrence. Pakistan's independence, as we call it, was a more meaningful happening as compared to what generally we have made of it. Pakistan's uniqueness owed itself to its newness, for in contrast with other countries which got independence around the same time when Pakistan be became independent, Pakistan was never on the map of the world as a separate political entity before August 1947. The other newly independent countries had already been there almost with the same territorial boundaries before they were annexed by foreign powers like Great Britain, Holland, France, Spain, or Portugal. These countries fought against foreign rule, launched their independence struggles, and eventually succeeded in realizing their lost status. These countries could hardly be called new countries. They were old, but were reborn. Pakistan was different from them. When the East India Company annexed the regions of Indian subcontinent, one after another, it did occupy those regions as well, which later became part of Pakistan. But at that point of time, when they were annexed by the company, they simply were a part of a wider India. It was at the end of the British occupation of the subcontinent that some of its regions, the Muslim majority provinces, were grouped together to give shape to the Federation of Pakistan. This federation was created in order to resolve one of the two major contradictions of the Indian society that had emerged after the occupation of India by the East India Company and later its handing it over to the British Crown after 1857. Of the two contradictions, the first and the older was the establishment of an alien rule in India, that is the advent of colonialism, while the second was the communal issue or the Hindu-Muslim divide, which became a political issue towards the end of the 19th century and dominated the Indian political scene up until partition in 1947. Pakistan was carved out of India in order to resolve the communal issue, for whose resolution within the United Indian Framework a number of proposals were projected, but they were all frustrated given the uncompromising policies and stubborn positions taken by some of the Indian leadership. 
that was obsessed with the idea of a highly centralized independent India without sufficient room for provincial autonomy and without allowing any degree of affirmative action for the Muslim community. This background of the creation of Pakistan, though acknowledged more generally, somehow came to overshadow the other major contradiction of Indian society, which certainly was also the contradiction of the regions that made Pakistan. This was colonialism and its deep-rooted presence in our regions. The separation from the rest of India in 1947 did not necessarily mean that we should have forgotten that we have imbibed colonialism in all its forms in our society. The coming to an end of an era that in its final decades imposed Lord Irwin, Wavell and Mountbatten and other colonial functionaries did not mean the withering away of the colonial system from the subcontinent. The reality of colonialism was intact and important after independence as it had been before. The departure of the direct political, British political control from Pakistan did not mean the departure of colonial roots and imprints from our society. Perhaps the most important negligence and failure of our country, our successes governments, our policy makers, our intelligentsia, and our academia were that all of them failed to look back at colonialism and its role in the restructuring and reshaping of the Indian society and also its deep-rooted impact as it continued to affect our country after independence. This means that our post-independence project in all sincerity needed to be the decolonization of the state and society without which the people could not have breathed in a characteristically different and independent environment. Here it would be useful to see what colonialism meant and in what manner it had affected our past of the world, our part of the world. Primarily the colonial power in India as well as elsewhere aimed at acquiring military outposts, trading centers, extracting surplus value, loot looting of the resources of the colony, and in certain cases establishing white settlements. Almost all these things were done in India. Then state power was redesigned making India, the British India, on the pattern of Belgian, Congo, Portuguese, Guinea, Spanish, Morocco, Dutch East Indies, British West Indies, French Indochina, German East Africa, in giving these names to the lands they had taken the European powers were openly proclaiming their intention to rule over them as subordinate parts of their own metropolitan states. By political, military, economic and ideological fetters, the European powers established their absolute power in the colonies. <clears throat> in India, the state during the colonial rule was primarily erected on the pillars of bureaucracy and military. British Prime Minister David Lloyd George had extolled that we, the Britishers, had given to India a steel frame that had brought the whole country under one administrative control. Colonial power structure operated under the guidance of the British Parliament laid down a whole range of laws to be implemented in the country. Wages were determined by it, taxes were decided at the higher level Land revenue, a uh, land tenure system, system was made and was given sanctity, etc. The British not only impacted the agrarian economy of India, induced in it the capitalist features, integrated it with the colonial capital and colonial markets, but also created new property classes in the agricultural sector as it did it in the trading and industrial sectors. The colonial language and education policies were also geared towards creating segments of society who could have served the interests of the masters. The colonial powers who expanded their empires across the world were already equipped with two basic concepts of education and types of syllabi. Essentialism 
in which they covered the basic principles to be imparted to their students and encyclopedism covering all subjects of knowledge. These two forms were already prevalent in the Western world since the 17th century. Two more concepts, that is pragmatism and system of polytechnics, were the outcome of the 19th and 20th centuries. In India, the colonialists and particularly Lord Macaulay recommended with all the force in his command that the essentialism of the British education system alone should be introduced in Indian schools. In his famous 1835 report, he emphasized that the purpose of education in India should be to create people whose culture and morals should be those of uh, the Westerners, for only this type of the social capital would be able to serve the colonial purposes. He emphasized at British essentialism, for that could inculcate among the Indian students the basic principles of morality, individualism, and a specialization in a certain subject. He was not much interested in the education of science, nor was he prepared to entertain the idea to benefit while devising the colonial education system from the traditional education and syllabi models prevalent in India before the beginning of the colonial rule. The latter was the idea held by many Orientalists who thought that Indian culture, literature, and languages also carry useful reservoir of knowledge that could be merged with the European essentialism to shape the colonial education model. Macaulay was against this. His minutes, in fact, written, were written against the Orientalists. Macaulay was also clear about to whom the colonial education should be provided. This had to be a class, an elite, English in morals and taste, and Indian in color. This class came mainly from the upper crust of the Indian society, the social and economic elite, that itself had been produced by the specific land ownership, administrative, and linguistic policies of the Raj. The more visible English educated segment came from within the middle class of the society, identified by social theorist Hamza Alavi as the salariat class aspiring to find places in colonial service, public sector, and judicial organs of the state. The colonial cultural policy was so designed that it discouraged local initiatives, declined to accept cultural diversity, marginalized the weaker, subdued the subalterns. Though at the administrative level, districts, divisions, and provinces were recognized, but they were mostly organized on the basis of administrative considerations and convenience. The terms autonomy and provincial autonomy did enter the political lexicon, yet the federation they were part of was not more than a paper federation as embodied in the Government of India Act 1935, a highly centralized document that was drafted to ensure an effective control of India through a combination of newly created political elite and the erstwhile administrative arm of the state. <clears throat> Pakistan inherited this whole ambit of colonial rule in 1947. Our famous Urdu poet Ahmed Nadeem Qasmi lamented, Bewakar azadi hum gharib mulkon ki Taj sar pe rakha hai, bediyan hai paon mein. Independence of us, the poor countries, carries no dignity. Crown covers the head, fettered are our feet. What these fetters were? We inherited a power structure with a preponderant place for the civil servants and the military top brass. Politicians and the legislatures, both at the center and provinces, had been pliable instruments to give the system a somewhat respectable color. It was the civil-military alliance that had taken Pakistan into the Western military alliances like CETO and the Baghdad Pact that later became CENTO, 
and had paved the way for the subjection of the country to foreign dictates. Pakistan was made subservient to the international financial institutions like Bretton Woods System, World Bank, IMF, etc. Instead of opting for a non-aligned foreign policy, Pakistan not only accepted to become the most allied ally of the United States and at times offered to act as the frontline state in American geostrategic designs, the character of the state, its administrative, economic and foreign policies thus took us from the colonial past to the new colonial present. Under the foreign-inspired, highly centralized structure of the state, there was not much space for the constitution and constitutionalism, parliamentary democracy, federalism, and all those values of social justice that had been the recurrent theme of the founding fathers who had spent all their lives for the realization of a socially just society for the Muslims of Indian subcontinent and later Pakistan. How sanctified the colonial structures had been for us can be seen from the fact that Balochistan became a province only after 23 years of independence, while it was in 1927 that Qaidi Azam was asking the British to give to Balochistan provincial status with the same quantum of autonomy as was enjoyed by other provinces of India. Not only this, federally administered tribal areas, the so-called FATA, a category given this name by the British, could merge with the Pakistani province Khyber Pakhtunkhwa in 2018, that is after 71 years of independence. For more than seven de decades, it remained outside the normal legal ambit of the country. This also means that the state of Pakistan could not realize its writ over its entire territory even after seven decades of independence. Going by the four elements of it, H.J. Lasky's state with the people, government, territory and sovereignty which we teach to our students, our state faltered on the latter two for seven long decades and continued the colonial system of control on a significant territory and its inhabitants. The constitutions themselves did not have easy sailings in the country. For nine years, Pakistan, uh, for nine years, Government of India Act 1935 reigned supreme and through it the colonial authoritarian arrangement of governance permeated in the body politic of Pakistan. The 1956 constitution was abrogated just two years after its inauguration. Field Marshal Ayub Khan gave a constitution in 1962 and himself abrogated it in 1969. Pakistan could get its unanimously accepted constitution only after lo losing half of the country and 54% of its population. Justice retired Dora Patel once observed that all the constitutions of Pakistan imbibe the spirit of 1935 Act. The constitution of 1973 was suspended in 1977, was restored in 1985 with amendments Im imposed by the Chief Martial Law Administrator, making it more of a presidential system. It was restored in 1997 to be put in abeyance in 1999 and was altered at the behest of another military ruler. It was only in 2010 that through the 18th Amendment, the Constitution's parliamentary character was restored and the ambit of provincial powers was enlarged. So the record of constitutional governance, which is so crucial for a state society equilibrium, and that ensures the continuity of citizens' social contract with the state, has largely remained dismal. In the presence of disconnect between state and society, what the latter is, uh, what, uh, uh, what the latter is left with is at best certain concessions or rewards. It is not what they get by way of their right. 
We know that rights make a people citizen, while their absence and mere living on concessions render them to be the subjects. Seventy-six years back, they certainly were subjects. They still long to become the citizens. In the socio-economic sphere, the most representative feature of colonialism transforming into new colonialism was the continued domination of the feudal class in our agrarian society. This class was created, protected, and nurtured by the British. Long time ago, economic historian S.M. Akhtar had disclosed that none of our feudal lords had his property ownership papers showing their date of origin going before 1857. They were the people who had served as collaborators of British rule. Lands were granted to them as rewards for their role in the establishment of the colonial rule. Later, the British introduced permanent land settlement acts to prevent the local landed elite from selling and mortgaging their lands. The Sindh archives in Karachi houses numerous such documents of rewards including the Afrin Namas, certificates given to those locals who had spied for the British. When the representative institutions were introduced in, in India, this landed aristocracy came to wield the scepter. Political power was drawn from the place where the economic exploitation was carried out. Decolonization in Pakistan thus necessitated land reforms, meaningful land reforms, in order to break the fetters of the peasantry and to free it from the age-old exploitative system. We did something in the name of land reforms in the 1960s and 1970s, but as economists Akmal Hussain and Mahmoud Hassan Khan show, these, given their loopholes, not only did not give the proclaimed dividends but also actually benefit the big, big, big landlords who surrendered their barren lands while they enhanced the productivity of the land kept by them through the newly introduced technology and the factors supporting mechanized farming that came as part of the so-called Green Revolution. Over the years, due to certain local and international economic factors, Feudalism has weakened in certain regions of the country, but the overall domination of the big landlords still remains intact. It was the very new colonial ambit in which our education and cultural policies were conceived, based not on the acceptance of the actual Pakistani reality. Pakistan's highly rich cultural diversity, our great historical heritage, our people's creative urges, their skills and initiatives, but on the projects designed at the higher level by those who were not oriented towards the people and their uplift. Their concern had been to ensure the continuity of the country as subservient to the global capitalist market, its mechanisms and modalities. On independence, the operators of the state power Government officials and policy makers did sit to ponder on the would-be education policy of the country. In fact, it was the time when colonial education system could have been and should have been replaced by an education system of a sovereign democratic state. This simply did not happen. Quite surprising were the proceedings of the Pakistan Educational Conference held at the federal capital, Karachi, from 27th November to 1st December 1947, that is some three and a half months after independence. Around 60 prominent political figures representing the federal and provincial governments and educationists participated in the conference, chaired by the federal education minister, Mr. Fazlur Rahman. After the five-day deliberations, a number of recommendations were suggested by various committees which had been asked to recommend about different sectors and dimensions of education. A close study of the document suggests that there were a number of aspects 
the experts had in, the, in their mind expansion of literacy, importance of science and technology, higher education, girls' education, imparting of religious education, and numerous other sectoral reforms. However, there was no realization that we have got rid of the colonial role and are now supposed to evolve our own independent education system. The learned gentry seem to have no idea whatsoever of what a democratic education system of an independent country meant and how the people belonging to different parts of the country with their cultural, linguistic and historical background could be made an active partner both as the facilitator as well as the recipients of the new education system. To the education planners, independence meant severing of relations from and getting rid of Hindu-dominated India. There was no appreciation of the fact that this could also be a point of departure from the colonial rule and whatever it stood for in social, political and educational domains. It is interesting that in the message to the conference, the founder of the nation, Muhammad Ali Jannah, did highlight the fact that it is quotation, under foreign rule for, a, for over a century, sufficient attention has not been paid to the education of our people. And if we are to make real spe speedy and substantial progress, we must earnestly tackle this question and bring our education policy and program on the lines suited to the genius of our people, consonant with our history and culture, and having regard to the modern conditions and vast developments that have taken place all over the world." Unquote. The subsequent education system and policies remained oblivious to the genius of our people, consonant with our history and culture. In its place, the colonial education structure and the inherent educational uh, policy were given way in the education system of the country, overruling the democratic character of education and surpassing the plural identity of Pakistani society, a highly centralized, divisive and segregated system remained operative since independence. <clears throat> As regards the content of the courses and the philosophy behind them, one finds it quite surprising that no serious debate took place in the country on its inception on how the modern education as prevalent in the world, the colonial educational traits and the traditional education as prevalent in the country should negotiate to evolve what we needed to adopt as the philosophy behind our independent state's education. It was quite opposite attitude to the one that was seen in the 19th century when the Western knowledge was transmitted to India through colonial means and the Indians' reaction to that resulted in a couple of new traditions in India. A modernist view as embodied in the work of Sir Syed Ahmed Khan was inspired more by the Western knowledge while a traditional view as found expression in the voices of Deoband and other religious seminaries apprehended it and represented the religious traditional position. Whatever was the merit and demerit of the two trends, this was important that they did respond to the Western knowledge and decided in what manner it should be accommodated and discarded. No such intellectual exercise happened in the case of Pakistan on its inception. The colonial model was adopted as such with its biases and contradictions, which in fact had to define Pakistan's education system in the decades to come. It would be illustrious to see here how some other countries, particularly in Latin America and Africa, have successfully implemented a decolonization project. These countries brought to the fore their indigenous cultures, their music and art, and regained for the commoners the lands grabbed through colonial approbation, 
reformed education and academia and removed colonial biases from the syllabi. Today, black is not a derogatory word. Today, it symbolizes enrichment of culture and self-confidence of a people. Our social scientists, particularly the historians, need to look at these facts. Unfortunately, a large number of Pakistani historians have not viewed their past and their contemporary times through this prism. Colonialism and new colonialism could never become the subject, subject matter of inquiry by most of our historians. We do not teach to our students the exploitative history of colonialism, which had hurt us to the deepest of our existence. We do not bring to their notice the resistance movements launched in almost all the regions of the country against foreign yoke. Our heroes and role models do not come from our real history and from the Sindhi, Baloch, Pakhtun and Punjabi historical social processes, but are created in an abstraction and in the romantic historical laboratories. It is only recently that some of our historians and some others have endeavored to study the colonial past of Pakistan along with its diverse aspects. Needless to say that what entering into that domain it would be, very dif difficult for us to identify where Pakistan faltered in the last. Without entering into that domain, it would be very difficult for us to identify where Pakistan faltered in the last 76 years in the spheres of politics, economy, education, and culture. Pakistan's contemporaneity desperately needs an engagement with its past, its post-colonial needs to be addressed, for which a dialogue between its politics and socio-economic realities on the one hand and its history on the other is imminent. Should we and would we think over it? Let this August conference ponder over it. Thank you. I may mention Hello, that uh, difficult questions would be answered by Charles. Uh, others uh, will be taken by me. Yes. No, sir, it's a very simple question. I am a student at IBA. I want to uh, know your opinion about the land reforms. Don't you think that it's now too late to go into that? It has been more than 75 years. Do we still uh, need to undo the damage done by the British government? Uh, I think it will further complicate the matters. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion? Thank you. Um, you know, uh, I'm not an economist, but uh, some important economists of our country uh, believe that uh, there is room for land reforms uh, is still it's there in, in, in the country. Uh, but I will enlarge my answer by saying that uh, it's not just land reforms in the sense in which generally they are taken. Uh, that is uh, decisions regarding uh, uh, the, the land holding, uh, how much land one should uh, keep. Uh, it requires whole uh, readdressal of the uh, rural economy. A number of new things have happened over the years which were not there in 1960s or 1970s when these land reforms were introduced. Uh, Tekhidari system, contract system is so common in uh, 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 agriculture now. Uh, this is one important thing. 
Then uh, 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 land tenure is, is still an issue. Uh, the the uh, uh, question of uh, 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 who can till the land easily is again an important thing. Uh, recently, we were in uh, uh, Sakhar uh, in a conference. There, uh, one land owner who was representing the land owning class said that uh, the peasants were given uh, lands uh, in these reforms, but they could not manage them and they returned those lands. So that tells more about, not as much about the inefficiency of the landless peasants, but more about uh, the fact that uh, giving uh, land to the landless peasants is not sufficient. They should be facilitated to make that land productive and agriculturally able. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Sir, I am Khanzeb Ahmed, student of IBA. Uh, I'm here, sir. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Sir, my question is, uh, sir, like when nations got independence, uh, they are clear about their like future. Like when China got in, got their independence, uh, and uh, like the rest of the nations, we in Pakistan are suffering from some certain kind of identity crisis. Like uh, we are not clear about whether I am a Pashtun, Baloch, Sindhi, or what else, or I am a Muslim, or uh, certain kind of these problems. Like we, our pathway is not clear. Not our, uh, from our syllabus point of view, and other uh, like uh, from our, we have like the whole of 76 years of history. It is a whole of ups and downs, and like youth is suffering from identity crisis. So for decolonization, isn't clarity a very necessary thing? Yes, uh, when I talk about decolonization, I mean this, that uh, Pakistan should have been developed as a federal democratic state right from the beginning, which necessitated the acceptance of all our uh, provincial identities. It's no good to say that I'm not a Punjabi and I'm not a Sindhi or Baloch. We are all Pakistanis. No, historically, we are first Punjabi, Sindhi and Baloch, etc. Then we became Pakistanis. So uh, uh, one can have multiple identities. Uh, it's not necessary to disown other uh, identities in order to emphasize at one identity, one. But when, when this is done and it is uh, uh, sort of uh, suggested that no, we are only and only Pakistanis, it amounts to uh, uh, forcing the people to accept that centralized you know, model that the state is trying to graft on the society and trying to force the people to accept, which the people have not accepted. And this is a one-way exercise. That is why Pakistan is facing all these crises. The day Pakistan will accept these identities and would try to evolve unity from this diversity, that day this crisis will start diminishing. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I am here, me Mukti Arosen to from Karachi University. Uh, sir, I have a particular question about Sir Sayyid Ahmed Khan. You talked about him. That uh, I want to just uh, clarify that what he wrote played. There is some uh, misconception about him because of some historians say that he played a role on uh, behalf of the colonizer. Would he play it or not? And another question is about education. In last, uh, I uh, listened from you, KK Aziz, in his book, Mother of uh, History. He talked about that we uh, misbehave with history. Would you think, it, it, is it really like that? Uh, many of the facts written in KK Aziz's book uh, uh, are correct. I mean, uh, he's very right when he identifies factual mistakes in our history books which are uh, quite in abundance in our uh, is, uh, schools and colleges syllabi. Coming to Sir Sayyid, Sir Sayyid is a, 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 a complex uh, subject, but I would say that uh, he was someone who realized uh, that uh, the Muslims of India, and particularly the, educate, uh, the, the middle class of India, that had uh, uh, better representation in uh, particularly uh, UP, in the official jobs, uh, their interest lied in associated, uh, associating with the British uh, 
uh, system of education, etc. He argued for that, uh, but uh, 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 to some extent he was successful, but in certain other domains uh, he was not that successful. His uh, efforts to uh, harmonize uh, Christi uh, Christianity and Islam and his uh, uh, formulations like uh, the Quran is the word of God and nature is the work of God, those things uh, did not, you know, uh, uh, materialize. Uh, 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 it never materialized even in the Western world where they tried to uh, bridge, uh, 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 become bridge between religion and science. Both are two different entities and should be uh, studied separately. Last question, please. My name is Aurangzeb and uh, I came from University of Baluchistan teaching their gender and development studies. Uh, my question to you is about the oligarchy powering, I mean, holding power by the very few, or we can call them the political elite, right? Since the inception, the partition in 1947. So very brief and straightforward, I would like to know that what is the way forward? I mean, still we have seen that as far as the legal system, as far as the educational system, or the, the social fabric, the very social fabrics is concerned, uh, that's controlled by the very few dominant uh, the, the, the dominant few, right? So what's the way forward? You know, uh, <laughs> this is uh, the most difficult question to answer, what's the way forward and what should be done. Um, I may mention that uh, uh, you, you refer to uh, the uh, concept of oligarchy uh, that was presented by uh, uh, Professor Hamza Levy. Uh, that ol oligarchy worked well for quite some time but from the time of uh, General Ziaulak, my view is this, that uh, within the military bureaucracy arrangement, uh, bureaucracy uh, became secondary and military became uh, dominant. And today, when I talk about establishment, or whoever talks about establishment, everyone knows that uh, this talk is about military and not as much about bureaucracy. So the oligarchy in that sense has weakened. Uh, there are other power centers in the country which have uh, emerged and they are also claiming for spaces. And I don't take a negative view of what's happening in Pakistan. I take a positive view because conflicts pave the way for new roads or new, uh, uh, you know, uh, way outs. So I don't think that things have uh, gone to uh, the place where we say that now this is the end of it. I think from this complex and uh, contesting situation, um, better options would emerge. Hi, um, I'm a student from IBA, Economics Department. Uh, you mentioned in your lecture that uh, um, a, a really important part of academic discourse is the concept of decolonization and colonization, right? But academia has been doing that since a very long time. And I mean, it's not very major in Pakistan, but to what extent does academia have that power to make actual change? Because there's currently a genocide happening in Gaza. And academia has been talking about, which is a colonial, an extension of the colonial project and an extension of modern, modernity and colonization, right? And so when we are seeing people die in the real world, and then there is academia that's still pretentiously talking about decolonization, so where is this change happening? And how do we, how, how do we integrate that? Um, uh, you have, uh, I mean, uh, integrated uh, both issues. Uh, as far as Palestine issue is concerned, I think that different segments of Pakistani society have uh, uh, raise their voices against the genocide in uh, Gaza. Uh, I have myself spoken uh, on two platforms and uh, other conferences are uh, going to be held in near future. So I don't think that there is uh, total silence at the level of academia or even at the level of uh, 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 media. Uh, what uh, the government should have done, this uh, uh, you all uh, can understand. Uh, what type of government we have, how much powerful it is, uh, what if uh, they have powers, uh, uh, what 
they would have done. So I don't think that uh, 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 I can comment on that, but as far as the media and uh, 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 academia is concerned, uh, voices are being raised from our side. I want to say, I, I, I have been instructed to give five minutes break and there is... One question. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that overview, Dr. Jafar. One question was that you said that there was no discussion about the partition that we should decolonize our education system. One thing is that there are discussions, but there is no need to be implemented. There are many things that happen. So, there are many things that happen. There are many things that happen. And there are many things that happen. There are many intellectuals that have to discuss the decolonization की होगी, including at the educational level. उसके इलावा तीन किस्म की शायद जुल्फी बुटो के time में, फिर जिया के time में, और उसके बाद शायद इमरान खान के time में एक indigenization पे बात हुई थी, और not very effective, लेकिन कुछ कुछ किस्म की कुछ कुछ moves हुए थे कि curriculum में, खासतौर पे अक्सर अमूमन ये करते हैं कि चलो decolonization का मतलब है थोड़ी अरबी और फारसी डालो so, but you can comment on that, that it was a good effort, but it was a good effort, but it was a good effort in that thought. Zainal, I think that I can't do this with you. That's why there is no such a meaningful, effective, noticeable move that we don't look at. Our deep and 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 deep that was protest against uh, social in, uh, injustices, political uh, injustices. Uske khilaf protest tha. Lekin colonial structures ko study karna aur unka alternative suggest karna ye nahi hua hamar yaan. Kisi had tak agar mein political arena mein dekhoon, to shayad national awami party ka jab manifesto ban raha tha, تو وہاں پہ اس طرح کی گفتگو ہوئی جو ان کے مینیفیسٹو میں ریفلیکٹ بھی ہوتی ہے جب انہوں نے کہا کہ ہمیں ویسٹرن ایلائنسز سے نکل آنا چاہیے اور ہمیں پروینچل اٹانومی چاہیے اور پروینچل اٹانومی سے پولیٹیکل سینس میں نہیں تھی وہ کلچرل اٹانومی کی بھی بات کر رہے تھے تو وائسز تھیں عبدالسمد اچک زئی اور غفار خان اور جی ایم سید ان لوگوں کے رول کو ہمیں انڈرمائن نہیں کرنا چاہیے ان کا رول تھا لیکن جس وقت میں بات کر رہا ہوں اکیڈیمیا کی تو میرے ذہن میں یہ لوگ نہیں تھے میرے ذہن میں وہ پروفیسر صاحبان تھے جو ہماری ایڈوکیشن پالیسی بنا رہے تھے ان میں بڑے پرومننٹ لوگ تھے جو بعد میں وزیر بنے ڈاکٹر محمود حسن خان وائس چانسلر آف ڈھاکا یونیورسٹی ڈاکٹر اشتیاک حسین قریشی who later became وائس چانسلر آف کراچی education ministers in the federal cabinets also. Peer Ilahi Bakshu was the education minister of province of Sen. He was sitting in that uh, uh, group of people. In some logon ko, any, kya Peer Ilahi Bakshu sahab ko nahi malum ta ki Sen ki kitni struggle rahi hai colonialism ke khinaaf. Dhaka University se aane wali hai maari professor sahab ko nahi pada da ki بنگالیوں نے کتنی سٹرگل کی تھی انگریزی استعمار کے خلاف وہ سارے ڈسکشنز نہیں ریفلیکٹ ہوتے اس ریپورٹ کے اندر جس کا میں نے حوالہ دیا اور یہ پاکستان بننے کے ساڑھے تین مہینے بعد یہ گیزرنگ ہوئی تھی I'm sorry I can't take any more of your questions Dr. Jaffer I'm grateful for this profound insights that you have provided us I mean one issue that that troubles me still is that the most two most colonial institutions in Pakistan are the army and the bureaucracy. They are by nature, by ontology, if I can use a philosophical jargon, basically colonial institutions. I mean, I live in Pindi and right across me was a road that was going through and they just blocked it. They just decided to say, so they wrote on the side of the road, no CVs allowed. I remember the time when I've got bored where they said no Indians allowed. Now they've changed the term to no civvies allowed. And the whole structure of the army remains fundamentally colonialism. I mean, up to now, we had even the commands in English talking about the educational base. The bureaucracy, I, I'm sorry, I, 
is, is a deeply troubling thing because they are the ones for whom the policy was made. The policy was that we'll create Indian bureaucrats who in every other aspect are going to be British except the color of the skin. To use that. But you have this problem. The third problem, I think, is the post-colonial period when Samuel Huntington argues that the army is the most right organization in a post-colonial state to bring about democracy. Except we never got out of it. So, so that, I'm just raising that it's just not the feudal. The feudals were created ex primarily in Punjab out of the British colonial model. The others were part of the chieftain structures that were there. Punjab, for the first time, provided land grants on the grounds of British loyalty. And it was not given. And I'm going to end it. Right? These are questions that he and I can call, talk all the time afterwards. But I'm just raising that please think about other possibilities that are there which dominate us. And right now, the dominus are not for the healthy in emergence of independence, if I can use that word. Thank you very, very much. I congratulate all of you for being here. I would request Dr. Karamat to present this to Dr. Jaffer.